They've come Hans Jokera. Uh, he's visiting uh, the XRC conference in Ottawa. He's a professor at the Berlin School of Economics and Law in Berlin. Uh, I'm Kurt Hübner. I'm uh, at the University of British Columbia, uh, director of the Institute of European Studies. And today we use the opportunity to talk a bit about some of the implications of the sovereign debt default crisis in Europe. Now, here in North America, uh, Matt Romney in the U.S. Uh, during his presidential campaign, as well as uh, Stephen Harper, the Prime Minister of Canada, they very often use uh, the situation in Europe as a justification and explanation for their own pretty austere uh, fiscal policy policies or policy plans. So what actually is really the role of public debt in regards to the uh, uh, existence and the coming to existence of the uh, sovereign debt crisis in Europe? Um, first, uh, we should make clear that uh, the public debt, the high public debt and the budget deficits are the result of, uh, of a crisis and uh, these uh, deficits do not cause the crisis. Uh, what we have, we have, uh, uh, you could say, uh, a misled creation of, of the European Monetary Union. We had uh, uh, not sufficient institutions in the labor market, we had no fiscal union, etc. A lot of problems and uh, this created a lot of imbalances within Europe. And then came the subprime crisis, and we had the same bubble in Spain as similar in the US, etc., and other European countries. And uh, governments had to bail out banks, uh, governments suffered from recession and, and loss of, of tax revenues, and then uh, this debt crisis uh, started. Actually, um, uh, what you can learn from Europe, uh, if a country uh, or region in a situation of recession uh, tries to balance budget deficits, the crisis will become deeper. I think this is really the lesson we can learn from Europe. Mm. This is very much uh, confirmed, uh, your letter point, uh, by a, uh, a statement by Christine uh, Lagarde, the head of the uh, International Monetary Fund, only a couple of days ago, where she uh, was hinting to Europe and saying uh, those harsh austerity measures are self-defeating. And indeed, uh, we see uh, the situation is not getting better. It's actually in terms of uh, public debt GDP ratios, it's getting worse. So, but still, at the same time, you also know that uh, in, in a couple of countries, there is a debt problem in the, in the long-term sense. So how would you see what is the best kind of appropriate balancing in policy terms to deal with those long-term debts, to bring them in a kind of, also from an intergenerational point of view, to kind of adequate uh, levels, and the other side, to stimulate economic growth, not only short-term, but also in a long-term sustainable way. Mm -hmm. What would you recommend? Mm -hmm. I, I think I, I completely agree. Uh, uh, public debt, if it becomes too high, can create a lot of problems. And uh, probably we should not uh, invite Greece or Portugal to, to follow very expansionary uh, fiscal policy. The problem we have in Europe, we have a very asymmetric process to solve the problem. Uh, this is a topic already discussed by Keynes. He always argued if we have international problems, if we have several countries involved, we should have a symmetric process. What would be extremely helpful uh, for Europe uh, would be that uh, Germany would not enforce uh, uh, very restrictive uh, policies to other countries. Uh, Germany itself should follow uh, a more expansionary fiscal policy. And, uh, and may, maybe, maybe I, I could add one important point, I think really one important point, when we look at wage development in Europe, uh, Wage increases in, in Spain, uh, Portugal, Greece were much too high. Mm -hmm. In Germany, wage increases were much too low. Mm -hmm. What would be very helpful to have now higher wage increases for some years in, in Germany than in other countries, and this would help to uh, 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 balance yeah, the imbalances and, and and, and, and of course, it would also help to, to create GDP growth. Mm -hmm. um, let me turn briefly to, uh, to one other dimension of the problem, to another actor, so to say, something we will discuss pretty soon here at the conference, uh, the role of the European Central Bank. So from a North American perspective, it's very interesting to see the battle about the European Central Bank with its long-term operation, refinancing uh, policies, uh, the, the famous Target 2 problem, very uh, interesting kind of uh, development, the discussion, particularly in Germany. 
how do you explain uh, the, 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 the positions taken by German politicians and uh, economists about the ECB? Isn't it true that uh, whatever the ECB did in the past, but it is the last two years, this is the only actor who in a relatively coherent way saved the day? Mm. When they didn't mm. solve the mm. euro crisis, but they at least they made clear that the, the union isn't falling apart. Yeah, yeah. A actually, that's a very important point. Uh, European Central Bank could at least immediately stop the sovereign debt crisis if, if it would promise, promise to step in uh, uh, without any limit. Mm. And this would not create inflation or something like that. Mm. Uh, this is done in, in, in let's call normal uh, central banks, li mm. like in the Federal Reserve and, uh, and other central banks. Uh, that's a very interesting question. Why uh, does Germany not accept such a policy? Um, I'm not 100% sure, and I also can ask you what, what your opinion mm -hmm. is. Uh, I, I have the feeling um, uh, that the first argument is really this, 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 this uh, very primitive idea uh, such a policy could cause inflation. Mm -hmm. um, what, in my opinion, is, is not the case. Uh, but what seems to be more important, uh, I feel that uh, uh, German politicians uh, believe they should keep high pressure on, on the southern European countries mm -hmm. to push them to, 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 uh, to reforms and, mm -hmm. and to, to change policies, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, whatever that means, that are very ne neoliberal policies, mm -hmm. what they are forced to. And, and uh, I think this, this, this is more this political argument. And then also I believe um, they simply do not want that these countries get the benefit and that Germany does not get the benefit. Mm -hmm. But what is, what is your interpretation of, of this uh, indeed very dysfunctional poli policy of, of, of Germany? I mean, I only can return and repeat what you're saying. Yeah. It's really a kind of puzzle. Uh, there are people uh, who are arguing it's all a kind of uh, implication of the so-called German stability culture. But actually, uh, I, even I, starting from, I don't like the combination of stability and culture. Culture <laughs> is something different. I don't think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, sure, there is this uh, the history of Weimar and the fear that uh, everything that is happening with the European Central Bank leads to inflation. Uh, very often, uh, talking to a lot of people, at least here in, in, in Canada, uh, you hear uh, the ECB currently is already printing money, and this will increase inflation. Uh, I think it's a bit of a kind of misunderstanding about central banking and explains a bit the kind of uh, the lack of uh, education in, in, in this area. But still, uh, there, it's a very strong narrative, I think so, and very deeply rooted in the kind of German thinking on average, given also the fact that uh, uh, economists in Germany are on average uh, rather orthodox, even in international comparison, very strict believing in their relatively narrow-minded kind of uh, uh, models. and uh, and. They are advising uh, Chancellor Merkel and, and, and the government, but it's not really this advice channel. I think there's really relatively a strong conviction aside of uh, German politicians. Uh, I don't think so that they are using uh, in a deliberate way the opportunity to change the social contract. But as a matter of fact, the implication is the social contract, something we call uh, democratic capitalism, is changing r radically and it's a really kind of uh, de-democratization uh, process that is uh, going along. Again, I don't think so. It's an intention of the government, but that's the kind of byproduct they are risking uh, with their very orthodox uh, attitude and stance uh, to say, okay, the ECB is only allowed X, Y, Z, but never is allowed to turn into a truly lender of last resort. But that's actually what is needed in order to save the day for the moment and then to deal with all those moral hazard problems that are definitely existing. Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, uh, uh, actually, it w would be no problem now uh, for the European Central Bank to step in as a lender of last resort because these moral, mo these moral, uh, ha moral hazard problems are are solved because mm. uh, uh, Germany very strictly tries to control e e uh, the, the European Commission as well, mm. uh, the, the budgetary policies of, of, mm. of the countries. So I, I think the moral hazard problems are solved. Uh, there would be no problem. Uh, uh, really that the European Central Bank could take over the land of last resort function. Okay, thank you very much.